On VE Day, May 7, 1945, the war in Europe came to a close. Across war-torn Europe, more than 45 million people lay dead. Men, women, and children, soldiers, and civilians alike. Among them were 12 million Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and others the Nazis deemed undesirable. A similar amount of those killed were displaced all over Europe, around 50 million. A majority of those 50 million included refugees and forced laborers, all longing to return to their home countries. Never before had death and destruction on this scale been seen, crimes for which could not go unpunished. Six and a half months after Germany's surrender, the Nuremberg trials commenced on November 20th, 1945. Leading the prosecution, Robert H. Jackson, stood before the assembled International Military Tribunal and gave the opening statement. Of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Before Jackson stood accused the remaining Nazi hierarchy, men such as Hermann Goering, founder of the Gestapo, head of the Luftwaffe, and president of the Reichstag, Alfred Jodl, head of the Überkommando des Herrs, OKH, the German High Command, Albert Speer, Reich Minister of Armaments and Munitions, and one of Hitler's favorite architects. Rudolf Hess, Deputy Führer of the Nazi Party, and 20 others. The 24 men brought forth at the Nuremberg trials were selected, as they represented every aspect of the Nazi regime. Over the following year, evidence was brought forth that established the crimes committed by the Nazis. One day of the hearings in particular, footage was shown at the Nazi concentration camps. Many people in the crowd openly wept. The Nazis were questioned about it. None of them said what they were seeing was not true. Instead, some, like Goering, seemed delighted and proud of what was done. Most argued they were simply following orders. Orders from Hitler, Goebbels, and Himmler to be carried out at all costs. This argument was quickly debunked, citing Rommel as an individual who disobeyed Hitler's direct orders. Of the 24, two were not tried, three were acquitted, Seven were sentenced to the varying years in prison, and twelve were sentenced to death. Only Hermann Göring escaped the hangman hours before his execution by swallowing a cyanide capsule. The rest of the Nazis sentenced to death were executed a few hours later on the morning of October 16, 1946. How did the United States arrive at this momentous occasion? How did the Allies agree to prosecute the Nazi hierarchy rather than perform summary executions or simply releasing them? Throughout the war years, the Allies, Britain, France, and eventually the United States had their own respective policies for dealing with Nazi atrocities. When the Allies met for the first time at Tehran, they stated their views of war crimes, discussed other issues over cigars, and carried on. It was at Yalta that the Allies agreed for the first time on a joint policy of dealing with Nazi atrocities. The Big Three, Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt, condemned Nazi atrocities and vowed to punish those responsible. Prior to this, the warring nations had their own policies of what they would do with captured Nazis. Historian R.A.J. Kokavi wrote, quote, Agreement on a joint allied policy was reached only after the end of the war. This issue of punishing war criminals was widely discussed throughout most of the war years and entailed a host of diplomatic, military, legal, and moral considerations and the interplay of domestic and world political factors, unquote. At the end of the war at the Potsdam Conference, the Big Three, Churchill, Stalin, and now Truman, reaffirmed their commitment to prosecuting war crimes. It was from this reaffirming that the Allies would come to finally set in motion a plan to prosecute war criminals. There were three plans the Allies could contend with. First, they could not punish the captured Nazis and instead allow for the Germans to try themselves. This idea was quickly abandoned, most not wanting to remember what happened at Leipzig after the First World War. Bosch writes on this, stating, quote, Men remembered Leipzig and wished no recurrence of the legal scandal perpetrated there, unquote. What happened at Leipzig was very few Germans responsible for war crimes were sentenced, and most getting off scot-free. More importantly, Kaiser Wilhelm II was not prosecuted and allowed to remain free and live out the remainder of his days in the Netherlands. Therefore, the Allies of the Second World War could not follow in their fa father's ways. <laughs> 
since it led to disastrous consequences. Not to mention, this would leave the victims without a sense of justice. Second, they could perform summary executions. This was a popular idea among the Big Three. Stalin in particular championed this considering the staggering losses the Soviets endured during the war. At one point, President Roosevelt was in favor of this, until he was convinced otherwise. Bosch writes, quote, Simpson repeatedly pleaded his views with Franklin Roosevelt, and on November 21, 1944, the president first indicated that he might be interested in an international trial, unquote. Third, they could bring to trial all Nazi perpetrators and let them answer for their crimes. Those who had committed multiple crimes across many nation states would have their own special court. This culminated with the creation of the Nuremberg Trials. The Allies signed an agreement which Article 1 stated, quote, There shall be established an international military tribunal for the trial of war criminals whose offenses have no particular geographical location, unquote. Electing to prosecute 24 Nazis who they felt represented every aspect of the Nazi regime, some of the more well-known names, Goering, Hess, Yildo, and Donitz, had direct links to atrocities, whereas others, Speer, Fritscher, and Frick, had benefited from the Nazi regime, but did not have direct links to atrocities. After the Allies were solidified in prosecuting war criminals, they signed the London Charter on August 8, 1945. This charter laid out how the Nuremberg trials would be commenced. It identified four categories from which someone could be indicted. Crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, cr war crimes, and conspiracy to carry out any multiple of the former. Not only this, but the London Charter established eight judges, two from each nation, France, Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States. The established law used to prosecute the Nazis was based on U.S. and British law. Now that the Allies agreed to prosecute Nazi war criminals, where were they to be held? Why was Nuremberg chosen? Other cities and locations were considered. The Soviets, for instance, wanted the trials to be located in Berlin. The other Allies, Britain, France, and the United States, were fine with this. However, Berlin had mostly been destroyed from the Allied bombing campaign. No building left standing could be renovated in time for the beginning of the trials. Since Berlin was out, the other Allies did concede to have the International Military Tribunal headquartered in Berlin. The Allies briefly considered elsewhere, including Leipzig and Luxembourg, but ultimately Nuremberg was chosen. John Kreider, editor for the New York Times, wrote, quote, The master trial will be held at Nuremberg, not only because the city ranks high in the history of Nazi terrorism, but more importantly because its courthouse is situated within a large compound, with tunnel connections between the prison and the scene of the trial, which will considerably simplify the security problem, unquote. The security issue was from strong rumors of a Nazi force fighting their way to release the Nazis and escape. To help with this, the Allies stationed troops around the compound. Tanks would be ready out front waiting for any Nazi onslaught. Everyone going in and out of the compound would be ID'd and checked. Nuremberg was chosen for two reasons. First, it was the birthplace of Nazism. Throughout the 1930s, it hosted numerous Nazi rallies. Every year from 1933 through the beginning of the Second World War, in September 1939, Nazis converged on the city to hear Hitler and other prominent Nazi members give speeches. Albert Speer had designed an arena from which to hold these rallies in. In 1935, the infamous Nuremberg Laws were passed, depriving German Jews of their property and citizenship. It put people into one of four categories, Deutsches Blutiger, Mischling Zwitten Grades, Mischling Ersten Grades, and Jud. Having the trials at Nuremberg would be a symbolic end to a murderous regime, laying bare the crimes the Nazis had committed to the entire world, thus not allowing for martyrdom to occur. Second, the Palace of Justice was left relatively undamaged from the war. It could quickly be expanded and renovated to hold the accused, prosecution, defense, judges from the various Allied nations, and enough room to hold 300 witnesses and media personnel. The Palace of Justice had the benefit of having a prison located directly behind the courthouse from which to house the Nazis in their custody. Not only could prisoners be held here securely, but a tunnel which linked the prison to the Palace of Justice could be utilized. This answered a security question the Allies had. The complex would be secured with troops stationed around it, and in the case the Nazis did try to mount an attack, it could be easily defended. What were American opinions and thoughts about prosecuting war criminals before, during, and after the Nuremberg trials? Were Americans, as is often perceived, 
behind the rule of law and support Robert Jackson in his quest to prosecute war crimes, or were they opposed? This documentary examines how wartime policy, legal perspectives, and public attitudes in newspapers demonstrate, just like the Big Three, the United States as a whole was not unified on the issue of punishing Nazi war criminals. This is not the story about the trials themselves, nor the controversies that surrounded them afterwards. Rather, this documentary gauges the reactions of various political, legal, and community leaders. By gauging these various reactions, primarily through newspaper accounts, one gains a better understanding of how indecisive the United States truly was. Over the last 50 years, plenty of historians have examined this very aspect of the Nuremberg Trials. Beginning in the late 1960s and early 1970s, historian William J. Bosch's book Judgment on Nuremberg described a vast array of American opinions, opinions ranging from political leaders, scholars, community leaders, doctors, moral leaders, and lawyers. From all these facets of life, Bosch builds his case that Americans had wide arrays of opinions, and most of them were opposed to the Nuremberg Trials. Tara Helfman examined the life of Francis Biddle and what led him to favoring certain policy positions over others. In the 1990s, R.A.J. Kokavi wrote Prelude to Nuremberg, Allied War Crimes Policy and the Question of Punishment. He re-examines wartime policy of the United States and found during the war, American policy was mixed toward war crimes. Sure, they were unified in decrying Nazi criminals, but what to do with them was where it becomes unclear. Other historians, such as Charles Allen Madison, Michael Salter, Bradley Smith, and Patricia Heberer examined various wartime policies of the United States. More recently, in the 2000s, historians and legal experts have re-examined the Nuremberg Trials and argue for or against its legality. Some questions they have asked include, were the trials legal? Or, were the trials fair? Or, was justice actually served at Nuremberg? And so on. Questions like these seek to explain why or why not the trials were legal. This latter group is not a focus of this documentary. However, it should be mentioned as this is where recent research has led. Other histories surround the Nuremberg Trials, the Holocaust, and World War II in general supplement findings of those authors used. Williamson Murray and Alan R. Millett's book, A War to Be Won, Fighting the Second World War, and Doris L. Bergen's War and Genocide, A Concise History of the Holocaust, both help explain events mentioned that might need further explaining. Now that the wartime policy and newspaper accounts of wartime events has been established, what was the biggest opposition faction? When reading editorials to newspapers, one gets an understanding for why individuals were opposed to the Nuremberg Trials. The vast majority of those who opposed the trials cited legality issues. There are two lines of thinking for this group. The trials would come back to haunt the United States, and the trials were a farce, just masking as summary executions. As seen before, early on in the war, the American public had a vast array of opinions. As the war progressed, two camps emerged, those in favor of prosecuting war criminals and those who were opposed. Those who opposed the trials usually said the outcome of the trials could come back to haunt the United States in the future. One individual who thought this was Hans Morgenthau, no relation to Henry Morgenthau. In the Chicago Daily Tribune, he was quoted saying that the trials were, quote, a double-edged sword that sets a dangerous precedent which in 10 or 20 years may be raised against ourselves, unquote. Morgenthau was a law professor at the University of Chicago when he was quoted in the Chicago Daily Tribune. A notable law professor who is credited with being beginning classical realism, later in his life he was known to oppose the Vietnam War. During the Nuremberg trials, his biggest criticism was that eventually the United States could find itself in the same position as the Nazis were. Another individual, long after the sentences were carried out, named Clarence B. Hughes, wrote to the Wall Street Journal saying he was, quote, in complete accord with Senator Tass Vies on the subject of the Nuremberg trial, as expressed in the newspaper accounts of his address of October 5th at Gambier, Ohio, unquote. Clarence was saying he was on the side of Senator Taft, who expressed disapproval of the Nuremberg trials. Taft went as far as to call them an unjust verdict and that it was a victor's justice. In an article of the New York Times from October 6, 1946, he is quoted as saying, quote, The verdict at Nuremberg was a miscarriage of justice, which the American people would long regret, unquote. Senator Taft believed the Nuremberg trials were a miscarriage of justice, going on to say, quote, The United States has helped to clothe vengeance in the forms of legal procedure, unquote. The article went on to say Taft was, quote, Sharply critical 
of the Roosevelt and Truman administrations on numerous domestic issues, unquote. How could the Allies declare organizations such as the Nazi Party, SS, and others to be criminal in nature? Furthermore, that membership or association with those organizations uh, could put an individual in jeopardy, all of which, as some legal experts argued, were declared ex post facto. That is, trying someone for a crime that was not a crime when they committed it. In this case, under German and international law, the SS, for example, was not an illegal organization until after the war when the Allies declared it to be one. This was the argument that law professor Hans J. Morgenthau and others held about the trials. The flip side to having the trials come back to haunt the United States was the argument that they were used for ex post facto law. Ex post facto law is defined as a law that retroactively changes the legal consequences of actions that were committed before the enactment of the law. This is to say, could the Allies try someone who unknowingly committed a crime that was determined to be so after the fact? In relation to the Nuremberg trial, this manifested in declaring Nazi organizations to be illegal and trying someone who is associated with them. Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson felt the need to counter the side of legality. In an article from the New York Times, Stimson defended the ex post facto law charges. In it, he counters the argument saying, quote, Charging the crime of aggressive warfare against the Nuremberg defendants did not constitute ex post facto law, but rather a new judicial process enforcing a moral judgment dating back to the First World War, unquote. He went on defending the Nuremberg trial saying they, quote, did not go beyond the scope of national and international law, unquote, saying, quote, international law is not a body of authoritative codes or statutes. It is the gradual expression of the moral judgments of the civilized world, unquote. Even the United States was not solely unified behind prosecuting Nazi war criminals. It was the determination of men like Robert Jackson who persuaded the American public and the allies of Britain, France, and the Soviet Union to take the Nazi hierarchy to trial. The largest opposition faction was that of legality. Its biggest fear was that it could come back to haunt the United States in the future. Jackson did his best to quail the uncertainties of this faction. It was not only United States policy of punishing Nazi war crimes, but the American public wanted punishment for those crimes too. Between Jackson and the public, this was it they could agree upon. Even as the trials ended, there were some boisterous voices who still opposed the trials. While it cannot be certain that they favored summary executions, it is clear they did not want the trials to occur. There would be subsequent trials that occurred over the next decade, though Nuremberg was the catalyst for these. Much like the public of yesteryear, the Nuremberg trials have been martyred with controversies that last to this day. Perhaps one day we will agree that the trials were for the better, but for now, they are still incite fears that the United States could fall victim of its own proposition. <laughs>